Data Week Online 2020. John, could I ask you to move to the next slide? Sorry. John's in charge of the slides <laughs> this morning. Thanks. So um, the Jean Golding Institute is one of the University of Bristol Research Institutes. Um, we act as a central hub for data science and data intensive research within the university. Um, the, there are, there's a number of different research institutes that have different subject domains, but ours is data science and data intensive research understood broadly. Um, our main remit is to try and build and connect multidisciplinary research across the university and collaborative research between our researchers at the university and those externally. And our external partners include charities and NGOs, industrial partners, uh, creative industries, all, 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 all kinds of different, different sorts of partners. Um, to do this, we run various different types of events, uh, talks, networking, um, public engagements, exhibition design and display. Uh, we put on regular training events throughout the year in different aspects of data science. We provide um, some seed corn funding, some pilot project funding for projects, and I suspect our next call will be late autumn of this year. We also run a data science advice service, which we call Ask JGR, where anybody within the university can give us a call or send us an email with their statistics or data science problem and we will try to solve it. And sometimes those queries turn into full-blown projects with UKRI funding to boot. Uh, so, you know, it's always worthwhile getting in touch with us if you have a challenge or, or an interesting issue or a problem that you'd like to discuss with us. Um, the Institute also acts as the portal for the university with the Alan Turing Institute, the National Institute for Data Science and AI. Um, I am the Turing University lead, the kind of senior Turing fellow for the university that liaises with the Alan Turing Institute and Patty Holly, the manager of the JGI, is the university liaison manager for that uh, as well. Uh, our priorities, which we refresh every year, um, are, as you can see here, societal challenges, uh, data visualisation, reproducibility and data governance and fundamental research across the primary disciplines. John, could you move on to the next slide? Thank you. So uh, this year, we have 13 events across the week in Data Science Week. Uh, we have moved as much as we could of our planned data science activities uh, for Data Week online. Um, You'll know if you're a regular for JGI that we hold a data week every every year and normally have um, a number of face-to-face of -face meetings and networking events across the week. But as I say, we've moved as many as we can of those online. And today we have three. So um, John is kicking us off with his uh, talk about working at and with the, the Turing Institute, experience as a fellow. And then later on, Michael Green from Luna 9 is going to be talking about increasing date engagement with data. And we have a training event as well. So just to give John a little bit of a note of introduction, I've known John for a couple of years since um, having the role of Turing University lead for, for Bristol. Um, it's a real pressure to be able to welcome him to join uh, to join us here at Bristol. I'm sorry it's not face to face. One of these days we'll get you here, John. Uh, John is the Marconi Professor of Communication Systems at the University of Cambridge. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society, a Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and has many other fellowships as well. Um, but I think the best title is that you are a researcher at large at the Alan Turing Institute, Fellow and Researcher at Large at the Alan Turing Institute. And we're very grateful for you coming to talk to us today about your work with and at the Turing. Okay, over to you, John. Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn my video off because, okay, that should help. Um, and Kate, if you can shout at me if, um, if I become inaudible. That will be fine. Um, so I'm going to give the sort of generic introduction to the Turing, and I'll try and give it a bit of spin from my own personal view, and then I'll switch to my um, couple of uh, projects I've been involved in. Uh, so uh, you get the kind of drift from the general to the specific. So just, I guess a lot of people know this, perhaps not everyone, but you know, the Turing is this um, National uh, Center Institute for Data Science and AI. And it basically is a hub for many other organizations. And I work in Cambridge, I used to work at UCL, and obviously 
uh, Bristol is is you know central to a lot of things, and so a lot of the other partners in the Turing. Um, the Turing does mostly foundational research, and mostly foundational research, but it does link to practical problems, and we have a bunch of strategic partners. Uh, who bring in practical problems. And I think I might divert into talking about one of those in particular at the moment because it's particularly interesting. But you can see the, the papers output by the Turing. And, uh, you just the, um, is connected successfully. What? Um, so um, if you look at the, the list of publications from the Turing, they're in pretty good places and they're reasonable numbers. If you think of the Turing as a really, really big program grant with a bunch of universities and a bunch of other partners, then uh, it's it's pretty um, successful in doing foundational fundamental research. It had a PhD program, which is just coming to an end. A number of students have finished. Um, the scaling of the Turing, adding another university set of universities meant we couldn't really run uh, a sort of a doctoral training center with, you know, it doesn't work with more than three, four, five partners. Um, so, so that's unfortunately finishing. But we we switched a lot of that resource into rich, enrichment students who visit the Turing. Um, obviously, not at the moment physically, but virtually. Um, the strategic partners I'll go on to in a second, but they give us this convening power because with all the universities involved, including other universities, they don't have to be Turing partners. We have um, a very large scale of potential for building teams quickly, and a, a couple of my own experiences kind of represent how well that can work. And we also have some innovative ways of working. Um, right now, obviously, a lot of virtual meetings are happening uh, pretty much every day. There are several, which is too many, um, but uh, it does prove that things are continuing apace. Uh, a project that I'm going to talk about later that we only started this year, um, I have a couple of meetings a week. Um, we have four postdocs on the project, and um, uh, we've already got two papers out there, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there's a bunch of different uh, areas that the Turing applies its AI and data science thinking in, and uh, one of the first was to to work with the NHS, and we've had a number of specific successes working with the Cystic Fibrosis Trust and the British Heart Foundation. But obviously, right now the hot topic is the COVID-19 pandemic, and I don't know how many slides on that because it's so recent, and also some of the material is is kind of not out yet in public. But just to say that. The Turing's response to looking at, at, at uh, COVID-19 has been pretty astonishing. And, and a lot of researchers, of course, that is, that's true. In my own university in Cambridge, there's a whole bunch of responses, um, uh, including we're actually testing all staff at the moment because uh, we have a scale out testing capability and we just ignored the, the government. And, and I, I believe that um, other places like London's doing that with the Crick and uh, I think Birmingham have been doing that with the Birmingham University Hospital because um, they have capacity for uh, upwards of 100,000 tests a day, which is kind of interesting. So it does change the the, the game if you if you have that kind of uh, scale and pace that you can do locally, uh, which is an interesting thing. But the more interesting data science uh, projects thing called DeCovid. If you go look it up, uh, there's a there's a project page now. It's looking at real time uh, data coming from uh, uh, the wards in hospitals and uh, figuring out what the optimum treatments are for people in ICU and other places. And that is, that's really uh, astounding. But there are lots of other projects that other people are involved in. Um, so there's a novel way of working and putting together projects super fast, it kind of, the response was good. I think in general, university research has, has approved its value, although the government, of course, won't give us some money, but uh, hey. Um, another very strong area in the Turing is applying uh, uh, data science in engineering. And there's a whole bunch of cool projects you can look up. Um, one of them is sort of digital twins general area, which is building essentially uh, uh, data driven simulations where the data is coming from the real world. Um, but that turned out to be interesting in COVID-19 as well, because the fact that we're monitoring things like uh, transportation and energy and air quality in real time, these things reflect uh, the response of the population in terms of you know staying in lockdown or moving around or uh, and so on and they can do it very precisely and so there's a there's another project which is uh, feeding information into a rural society initiative on um, building models of what's happening um, uh, during the various phases of uh, the epidemic and these things are, are of interest you know very long term in many many ways so that 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 whole uh, safer smarter engineering program is I think uh, really um, really promising. Um, and uh, I think in the long run, that will also feed into a program we we just 
putting together something in environment. Um, and pretty much every university has activities and environment. Um, and one of the interesting things is, you know, the, the temporary improvement in air quality. Uh, specifically, we had lots of detailed uh, data from London, also have data from Hong Kong and Beijing uh, with some partners there. Um, and it's really interesting, you know, what was the impact of having virtually no one driving around? And of course, this has led to, I guess, people saw on the news recently, uh, the uh, in, the emergence of large, large scale investment in, in cycle lanes and pedestrians and public transport, rather than having lots of private cars. Uh, and so again, long term, that can pay off, but having models that drive that um, based, based on actual data that tell you what the impact is seems like a, a good plan, and that's one of the things that Turing is contributing to. Um, a very large area in the Turing with, um, oh, I should say, in the engineering area, one of the partners was Lloyd's Register, and Lloyd's Register is uh, basically connected with the Lloyd Shipping Insurance people, but they have uh, models of lots of buildings, and they have a, a big interest in understanding how things work there. Um, the um, uh, so the the next partner that's relevant is sort of from national security, um, and uh, the main partner there is visible is, is NCSC, which is the National Center for Cybersecurity. Um, but they uh, obviously are a front for GCHQ and other folks, and um, they're um, interested in understanding uh, unrest in areas of conflict. But they also have a slightly more uh, sort of civil society interests as well. Um, I was thinking they should build a real-time map of endangered statues. That would be an amusing thing to do at the moment, or perhaps not amusing. Um, yeah, anyway, so um, bizarrely, there are a whole bunch of people standing outside a statue um, of um, uh, Mary Ann Evans, who's as a real name of George Eliot, who's the uh, uh, authoress who, who wrote The Mill on the Floss. It's a bit weird. Why is anyone think that's an endangered statue. But anyway, that's the sort of thing those folks worry about. Um, they, we, we'll get on to a, a, a useful thing that, that, that they did that, that's more generally useful, but there's a link between this and one of my projects, which is now being uh, used as one of the uh, underpinning ways to build safe havens, which are ways you can uh, store data in an incredibly secure way so you cannot, cannot accidentally leak it. And this is uh, very useful if you have highly sensitive uh, private data, which could be healthcare data, which is uh, personally identifying information in, uh, could be financial data, and so on. Um, and if you want to do data science on that data, but not accidentally look at it yourself, you just want to build models, uh, then there are ways to do that. And that came out of partly out of this program. Um, another large area, which originally was uh, the biggest partner was HSBC, was understand the economy. This is going to reemerge. Right now, obviously, for the impact of a pandemic and, and lockdown on the economy is uh, one of the biggest problems uh, we face in the next few years. And um, we have people that build very sophisticated large scale models, both in real time, uh, but also you know long term modeling of uh, uh, economics. Uh, and one of the one of the um, people we work with there is the Financial Conduct Authority. We've done a number of small projects with them. And again, the super sensitive data, which you have to worry about. Um, and they're very interesting because the, uh, they do model uh, sudden impulse effects on the economy. And so uh, sh how shocks impact a system is, is very interesting. So they have the tools to look at uh, health as well as, you know, sort of, as, well as, as sort of natural human health uh, as well as uh, economic health. So, um, so I think that's, uh, that's an interesting thing that shows the underpinning generality of the models and approaches to data science that one can build, uh, potentially. Um, we have uh, a very strong interest in the Turing, uh, in data ethics. We have a number of partners like the ICO, who look after the implementation of uh, a GDPR. Um, and we have a, a, an interest group, for example, that works in fairness, um, transparency, and, and um, Accountability of algorithms, and that group had quite a big impact. And one of the one of the members of that group, Chris Russell, actually uh, had a paper which which basically changed how uh, Google software uh, for data science works. Um, so uh, they actually added um, capability for explainability um, that was a result of the the work in thinking about um, accountability and fairness. And this is, of course, an, on, an ongoing area. It's a very important area. And as people develop more and more tools, and in, in particularly what used to be known as black box AI and uh, convolutional neural nets and so on, having some ways to uh, uh, do counterfactual reasoning about what they do, or indeed create directly explicable models of what's going on in them is, is, is increasingly important. 
Um, and so that uh, that would be a useful thing to do. One of the interesting things you could think about in the context of COVID-19, if you want to look at everything through that lens, is that we know that there's a disproportionate impact of the disease in, uh, in um, getting very ill and dying in the BAME uh, part of the population. Um, and it's not obvious, uh, although some people seem to think it is, that it's uh, it's just to do with social um, uh, justice or you know balance of wealth and poverty um, or partly genetic and understanding whether there is some element of each is incredibly complex um, and uh, so I think there's a an area that's important to, to get there um, which uh, I personally think it's unlikely to be genetic in the sense that there's nothing in common genetically uh, closer between people from Africa and people from Bengal and people from South America and people from Europe. So the fact there's a common difference sounds to me like it's all social, socioeconomic. But we should demonstrate that scientifically so we have an evidence-based understanding and that also tells you what the intervention should be. Um, so. We're also very interested, we had a number of people over the last few years in the Turing who've got an interest in, uh, in uh, computer hardware. And some of the partners have a long history in Cambridge. We've been working with ARM forever on processor design. Uh, Intel is a partner in the Turing and is super interested in acceleration, um, particular, uh, obviously GPUs are commonly used in, in particular in um, uh, natural language processing, but a number of other areas, image processing, obviously what they're designed for. Um, and uh, acceleration also potentially um, reduction energy consumption while you're doing machine learning uh, on large data sets seems like a useful thing to do. And we're interested in um, supporting better security while using accelerators. Um, so this is all uh, uh, of interest. Edinburgh, Manchester, Cambridge, other partners have, uh, 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 actually, yeah, Bristol. And plenty of people have hardware expertise. UK is quite strong in this area. Um, particularly, there are more ARM chips in the world than there are Intel chips in the world. But Intel's a partner here, uh, but they're open to having other partners. And uh, that's uh, um, clearly an important topic. So that's kind of fun. Um, and then one of the that emerged more recently has been scaling up uh, in the humanities, but also in the traditional natural sciences. Um, so uh, the British Library, which is where the Turing has been physically situated in, it, in its hub, in its center, obviously has a, a, a national copyright library collection, which is everything basically. Um, and they're interested in how you find your way around that kind of scale of information. But also on the other end of the, the, the scale, there's things like um, square kilometers array telescope and systems that generate really insane amounts of huge uh, um, bit streams of data. And uh, just put, scaling up to manage how you deal with that is a, a, a good challenge. It involves specialized hardware, but also potentially new algorithms for finding information um, uh, from those sources. So that's kind of fun. Um, this is an area, uh, uh, this slide is about fostering government innovation. And I think one of the impacts of this year is going to be the government uh, has a, had a severe wake up call about having to understand how to use data science, in, in particular in speeding up its response to health, but that's going to apply in generally in the economy. Um, and there are other areas where I kind of jokingly say they should apply this to law. Uh, law is one of the sl slowest moving areas um, in terms of adopting the technology. Um, clearly, obviously, in forensic sciences, the law uses, uh, uh, or the police and forensic labs use uh, computing a lot. But in the processes in law, they're um, particularly uh, uh, error prone and weak on the use of, uh, of data. And it will be really useful to understand that better. And there's work led by Helen Margaret in Oxford, um, but with a lot of work in the Turing, trying to engage with the Department for Justice. And I think that's going to be a big, uh, a big change as well. Uh, eventually, um, uh, I think uh, they'll have to adopt processes where instead of having to counsel about 30% of court cases, because the wrong people went to the wrong place or the evidence didn't show up in the court, they'll fix those kind of minor problems, which are actually very stressful. Um, but I think, you know, the obvious uh, healthcare and econ economics are, are more obvious places. We, we need things here and now. Okay, so enough about the kind of general programs. What I was going to talk about um, uh, now is a, a bit about the ways the Turing has been effective, and then I'll get to drill down to a couple of examples um, where um, my own work has benefited from being engaged in the Turing. 
Um, so um, there's a set of core capabilities uh, that I've kind of gone through, system architecture, security, core statistics underpinning a lot of uh, smart people from math and statistics departments, applied uh, maths, and as well as computer science and, and, and other disciplines have been um, engaged a lot, uh, and so and social sciences and so on. Um, there's also another set of instruments that the Turing uses to, for going forward, for actually activities that, that, that make things happen. So I already mentioned one of these research interest groups. Research interest groups are, are just being rebooted because uh, they're working, um, but obviously going virtual, we need to rethink how well they work with um, these kind of meeting, online meetings. Uh, typically, these groups are fairly small numbers of people, so you can use uh, tools like Zoom with uh, real-time video and interaction rather than a kind of talks, uh, although we do also have talks. So there's a number of these areas um, that have been uh, quite successful. Uh, one area was uh, it resulted in a, a Lloyd's Register a very nice report on the limitations of what you might use blockchain for, which is quite often you hear uh, techno solutionists going, oh, blockchain is your answer, and, and actually they wrote a nice document that said, well, not really, most of the time it isn't. So I quite like that 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 work that was in the first couple of years. There are a whole bunch of interesting uh, other uh, research interest groups. I, I mentioned fairness, transparency, and privacy. The FTP group is good. Data ethics group. Uh, there's a social data science group which has been super excellent as well, tackling problems where data is extremely messy, uh, lots of missing data, all kinds of other uh, problems there. Um, and uh, and so on. Um, uh, these are some of these groups are set up with a specific goal to re write a report, like the blockchain one. Some of them are ongoing responses to what's happening all the time, and some of them have a specific outcome that could be uh, to put together a, a funding proposal. So, which we'll get onto in a second. Um, the other instrument that I've liked uh, over the last three years has been data study groups. Data study groups are an incredibly um, powerful instrument. They're basically hackathons, um, and this is going to be interesting to see how we cope with going virtual, because these are worked by bringing people together for a week in the Turing. They're driven by an external organization bringing a problem or a challenge to us. We then find somebody to lead on uh, trying to tackle that challenge. We get a large number of people together in the Turing uh, for a week um, who, where we have prepared, to some extent, uh, the data. So we may have wrangled the data. Um, the problems are presented by the partners who've got the challenge. Uh, and then there's a brainstorming, modeling, problem solving. And then by the end of the week, typically we have had a number of groups um, in upwards of 50 people may be divided into five groups of 10 people, come up with several solutions, competing solutions to see which are best. And there are lots of examples I could go through of uh, this as being really fantastic. There was one looking at um, very high resolution 3D electron microscopy images from the Crick, and uh, one guy with his laptop used traditional image processing and nearly beat everyone else. But one of the convolutional neural net groups slightly beat him, although they did use about 100 times the computing resource, um, but they did slightly better. And um, that was super interesting in terms of classifying uh, anomalies in, in, in cells, um, essentially for oncologists. Um, and that was that was interesting. There are, lot, there are lots of other uh, uh, nice ones. One of them was in um, real-time signal processing, where data was given by the GSMA, which is the Professional Association for Cellular uh, Phone Providers, and they had a bunch of data from people trying to jam cell phone networks in various countries where that kind of thing might might happen. You can imagine where, and they couldn't locate the jammers. And by the end of the week, there's a couple of groups have come up with completely new algorithms that, that successfully did locate the jamming sources. And that's actually a known hard problem. It's a signal processing problem. Uh, 50 years, people have done machine learning on signal processing, um, but the, this has not been solved. And so now we actually have a couple of uh, approaches that are, are not just promising, but you know, they're, they're ways that will go forward. Um, and these, again, these data study groups, there's a huge amount of effort. And, and one of the things data study group illustrates is uh, another strength that Turing has, which is it has a, a research and engineering group. So Turing was able, in its original funding, to justify hiring a team of people. These are typically people with PhDs that have a very application-minded. Uh, they like coding. They like supporting teams of people. Uh, they understand the research because they've done it in themselves, but they also want to help build things out. And so they help with data wrangling and they help with making sure systems are up and running for a data study group. Uh, so we have a lot of cloud resources at the Turing, donated by Microsoft as 
as well as uh, uh, Amazon and other cloud uh, providers. Um, and so in some of the larger problems, one may need to use that, or one, one person and their laptop may not be sufficient. Well, the REG are really good at that. They've actually shrink wrapped a number of standard machine learning toolkits so that they're almost like a, you know drag and drop one click uh, for for common problems where uh, the math stats people have a new idea. They don't want to spend weeks learning how to install Docker and Kubernetes and a bunch of other things. And so they're just uh, you know they're just supported in doing that. And the REG are, are, are really great. They're basically like um, uh, in companies in research labs like Microsoft Research, you have RSDEs a similar role. Um, it's quite hard in computer science departments to justify having people like that in research grants. It's it's really tricky, and the REF kind of mitigates against people uh, in those roles. So the Turing's quite lucky in, in establishing that. In other subjects, you can have you know lab tech support, uh, although typically they they may not be at the level of, of uh, training of, of, of PhDs. They may be. It depends on the subject. Uh, so the Turing has that. At the moment, we've actually redirected significant effort from the REG into supporting some of the COVID-19 projects with the NHS that I mentioned. So that's uh, that's taken the heat off that uh, for for the next couple of months. Um, but they will be back in a bit. And then the other thing that's be, that started recently was um, surprisingly we didn't have. Uh, the theory equivalent of data study groups. So data study groups are applied, but we really, really uh, do a lot of foundational work, but there weren't, weren't any groups to scale up uh, how to tackle problems uh, from a theoretical standpoint. So Yanis Kanidis from Warwick uh, pushed this for a while, and we supported him, and now we've had a couple of these that are fortnight rather than a week, because you have to think uh, a lot more. You can't just uh, get in and hack, and also you you can't really do the prep work with an engineering group. It's a different nature of, of, of the thing. And these are a little bit like people are familiar with the, the Newton Institute. Well, no, they they sponsor things like that. Um, but these are these are focused on data science, and um, uh, they've been uh, 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 these three I kind of mentioned. Um, one is one, one of my favorite ones as an ex you know recovering physicist. I really like Phi ML, which is physics informed machine learning, where you have two levels of model. You have a model that comes from the underpinning physics theory, and you have a, a model learned by machine learning. And you can optimize the two of these. You may not be able to solve. Uh, uh, analytically, the equations from your physics model, uh, and you may be able to speed up and scale up the machine learning model uh, by informing it um, where to apply more scale or more or less scale is more to the point. And there are lots of examples in turbulent flow, many many problems where this works really nicely, but it's a really hot topic. Um, second area of theory of methods um, challenge Fortnite, which happened uh, a few. Um, Couple months back was a prediction algorithms with causal interpretation and causal uh, reasoning is a really uh, important, powerful tool. Causal inference is sort of one of those uh, um, things which is uh, making headway. It's been around for a long time. I mean, understanding that smoking causes lung cancer is an example of this. But a lot of people will keep talking about, oh well, you know, correlation is not causation uh, until you beat them over the head with uh, you've control for every possible other thing and you also look at a uh, slightly more subtle idea of causal inference uh, which is to do with the uh, the the essentially dealing with confounding um, uh, interpretations and there's a, there's a whole bunch of other tools so uh, not my area of expertise so I'll shut up about that but but really really nice and then there's a one coming up on the theory of deep learning so uh, really explaining why these systems work also when they go wrong when adversarial images really mess up some of the uh, self-driving vehicles for example um, so there are lots of impact stories we could go into in the past. Um, I think the I already mentioned a fairer algorithmic led um, uh, decisions, making simulations simpler is a good one. Right to an explanation is another one. So these are all these are all things I will skip over in the interest of time. But you can all look at my slides and ask me questions later. Um, so okay, so I've been in the Turing since before it started. So I was part of the team in Cambridge that wrote our. Proposal that went in with lots of proposals that went into making it, and um, I quite like the Turing physically, or have liked it physically because I have my family live near it. Even though I live and work in Cambridge in term time, um, I'm seven minutes bike ride from it. So, and it's also historically from uh, King's Cross uh, or St Pancras straight into uh, the heart of Europe, which I was quite like dropping in on friends in Paris. Um, it's about it's about the same journey time as getting to Bristol, I, I imagine. Um, 
so um, so that's been that's been quite nice. But I'm going to talk about a couple of the projects that I've been involved in. Um, and but for first, is just a sort of some of the um, uh, some of the background. So um, yeah, so there's interaction with other people. Um, one of the things is um, by interacting with other people, we realized early on, um, four or five years ago, that we were going to get sensitive data and we really had to worry about privacy preserving data analysis. And that was going to be important. And that was conversations on the 20th floor of HSPC in Canary Wharf made it obvious. Conversations with the NHS folks and originally NHS Scotland made it really obvious and so on. We also worried about the uh, data science and digital humanities. And um, in fact, I actually have a two PhD students in the Turing just finishing. Uh, uh, one of them works in real time um, uh, machine learning uh, with privacy preserving on personal uh, well being data. And the other one works in wearable computers, which is, uh, and she works in understanding why people don't like wearable computers. And so she's effectively working in a uh, thing uh, using uh, science fiction stories to understand uh, what it is about people's objections to things. This sounds a bit crazy, but actually um, this is a, a well understood technique in HCI for uh, eliciting uh, uh, responses rather than just doing questionnaires. So it's kind of fun. Um, all kinds of interesting interactions with people doing urban analytics. Um, one of one of the things that I worked in is tracking uh, f encounters between people and phones, uh, and this turns into uh, tracing apps on phones, which may or may not work. We will see what comes out of the other white uh, test bed. Uh, I've already mentioned FTP. Um, uh, also interested in data ethics a lot of the time, and all kinds of other areas are kind of fun. So, um, so what happens when you're in the Turing is. Uh, if you physically go there, and of course, as a, as a fellow coming from one of the universities, it's, it's a trip for most people, unless you're lucky and you work at, at UCL and it's walk over the road. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, it's a trip from somewhere, so, so why would you go there? And it's, it's partly that you can go to these various events. Uh, I didn't mention all the workshops that were happening. Of course, now they're all virtual, um, so you can still go to these events. And I believe that we've now discovered that we really should be running all events as a mix. Um, when we can get back to physical meetings, we'll probably want to keep the meeting density of people relatively low, uh, but, but maintain their remote access and figure out how do we make, ma maximize the interactivity as well. That would be super interesting. But the, the really important thing is that, that that won't work very well with the remote attendee in larger groups is, is the sort of creative step that comes out of chatting to somebody over coffee and so on. Um, but a couple of things that did come out of this, um, I just I just talk about these two projects. And one was um, a project called Maru. Uh, Maru is a secure enclaves for AI. Um, this was funded out of the Turing's Defense and Security Program. Uh, interestingly enough, it had a partner at Imperial, um, a, 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 an ex student from Cambridge, a colleague of mine, uh, Peter Pietzuk, who's a, a professor at Imperial in the Department of Computing. Um, they were not a Turing partner. Um, but um, they were a serious expert and uh, Intel were interested in what we might do, uh, building safe havens that would allow computation that would not be able to accidentally leak uh, data and would not be susceptible to security attacks on the systems. So, um, so we built a system. And what was interesting in the project was uh, that the, it, it represented, well, several things. One was the convening power of the Turing. We were able to get anyone interested in using Intel's uh, software guard extensions uh, to workshops to talk about what uh, what works and what didn't work. Uh, people who are expert in this will know that there are major security problems with SGX, uh, which we won't go into here. There's a sort of specific partial failure of the project that we did that was not our fault, but um, and we'll have to uh, see major fix from Intel. There's follow-up influence on what ARM and the RISC-5 people are doing in their processor design. So people are interested in that, they can contact me and I can join them up with other folks working there. But we generated software. But one of the really cool things, which was I really like, was NCSE, which are the kind of people that have names that rather than the people from the GCHQ don't give you their names. Um, they, um, they were working with us and they were committing code to our repo. So we were developing a, 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 essentially um, a version of Spark. So you could run Spark R code in an enclave so that it wouldn't accidentally leak um, data or code. And uh, they were testing it on data that we didn't want to look at, you know, high-res satellite images of conflicts, probably, I'm guessing, I don't know. And they would then commit fixes to our code and was like, wow, this is a proper partnership. And apparently it was quite a good experience for them. They'd never worked with something where 
somebody else without clearance was developing stuff they could use, they could then commit code back, and we would make progress in a collective way. So that was a very, a very nice experience. I think it was uh, surprisingly positive on both sides. And I believe there are other projects that are using the same approach for kind of working at arm's length, so to speak, but also able to really have a real collaboration. And it's, it's quite something when you say, you know, you see a, 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 a performance or a bug fix being checked in by somebody and they say, I've tested on this, you know, really large data set and, you know, I fixed this by batching these various bits of this machine learning algorithm in this way and that means you have to do the secure batching through the Spark API. Anyway, it was kind of cool to do that and I think that was a, a really nice experience all around. Um, but the other project that we have, I think, is sort of really huge um, uh, uh, project, which has got external funding. So this funding didn't come from um, within the, uh, the strategic partners of the Turing, um, but this came from the Gates Foundation. So the Gates Foundation, I guess everyone knows, uh, Bill Gates took his ill-gotten gains from Microsoft and suddenly became this good guy and decided to invest very large amounts of money in, in vaccination programs in developing countries. And I, I hadn't known this until uh, the um, chief rep showed up uh, at the Turing and he said he was looking for partners to work on uh, digital identity systems. And the reason is the Gates Foundation has a large program of work in trying to um, improve wealth in the poorest one billion on the, on the, in the world. So as well as fixing, you know, clean water supplies and vaccination programs, uh, they're also trying to figure out how you uh, essentially um, uh, lift uh, the, the poorest billion out of the lowest level of, of, of wealth. And part of that is um, understanding things like microloans. Uh, and there are all kinds of programs in, in India and Africa that have deployed systems that do that, that allow somebody to borrow money to get enough equipment to start a small clothing business or whatever it happens to be. Um, but part of that is you need to have some way to uh, to deal with how do you do know your customer, which is a thing many of you may have had to deal with with banks. Um, and it costs hundreds of dollars or hundreds of euros, hundreds of pounds to do a know your customer in Europe, North America. This is because they're completely outmoded technology. And one of the simpler bootstrapping things might be to have an identity system, which means that the person just shows some form of ID and the bank goes, ah, oh, that's who you are, great, they make that connection. But it's a lot more complicated than that. So this trustworthiness in digital IT systems is that a lot of people in a lot of countries, possibly even this country, may not trust their government or government agencies. They may not trust private agencies. And so you need to have systems that deal with a lack of trust. Um, in, in, so you need, an, you need a, a way for organizations to run ID systems that may be disaggregated and decentralized, and they may provide uh, proof of some property that, for example, you're over 18, therefore you can buy a beer, uh, or you have a legal driving license, but provide no other data, and they only provide it to authorized people in the right way. And nobody else can go and trawl all the data and find all the people who are over 18 or under 18 in some group. Um, so, so this we've done a bunch of work on this. It's been running since really just since January, um, and we had a call from some uh, mini projects as well to extend the work, and we've got some really great uh, submissions, and we're going to add some anthropologists who are going to do field trips as soon as they can to go and understand what people object to or, or accept in different places like Ghana and Kenya uh, or the Philippines or Morocco um, or Canada or Estonia um, or the UK. And we need to uh, also understand uh, how we have an impact. It's a very big project, and we'd like to influence standards. And we need to use our research engineering team uh, to build prototypes that we can uh, work. The researchers can write code too. That's how we work in the Turing. Um, but we want to support um, shipping code to other people so they may be able to integrate it into their systems. Now, as a result of this, this project, as a result of, of, of COVID-19, the pandemic, the two of my postdocs on this project uh, who, were, who were experts in um, secure multi-party computations, decided to look at uh, contact tracing apps and build a better one. And then we, we got on, onto the idea of immunity certificates, uh, which is in fact uh, medically a bad idea, um, but actually understanding uh, the risk that somebody undertakes by going out and meeting people or that they incur to other people by going out, um, by looking at, for example, antibody levels, may be something useful in the long run. And so we built a couple of uh, prototypes for this, and we have a couple of papers on archive, which if people want to see the kind of thing uh, we're doing and the sort of skill sets we have in the program, 
um, that's kind of interesting. We also have uh, another couple of papers coming along. One is on understanding attitudes to risk in different countries, and the other is a survey of trustworthy systems, not just digital identity, but other software systems. Why would you trust a piece of software? Um, it would be nice if it was all written in some you know, type safe language and, and had verification against some specification. But in the absence of that, you may be able to make something reasonably trustworthy uh, by various designs, uh, design techniques. So we have some um, ongoing work there. And of course, many people out there do that kind of work. We're, we're surveying it in those two areas. That's a more useful thing to do, get a state-of-the-art survey. Um, so those are those are two projects that, uh, that I have um, ongoing. Um, uh, uh, having having uh, safe data havens is, is that's ongoing in practice with DCOVID, and the Gates project has literally only just started, so that's kind of interesting. The other thing that I was involved in, which was kind of fun, uh, was mapping the research going on in the Turing. Um, and we did a bunch of topic modeling with uh, Mark Bryars, who's one of the uh, program directors in Maturing, which was kind of fun. Um, uh, but we also did a bibliometric study, um, which we haven't published yet, but we will do. We, we have some tools for looking at all the papers published in the world in a given area and analyzing uh, the network of authors and co-authorship and the evolution of areas and so on. Um, and if you're interested in communications, then I can point you a paper on, on that one, which is published. Uh, but we're, we're just going to rerun one uh, on, um, uh, uh, on the general area of machine learning and AI, which we think will be uh, kind of fun. We, we, we have a, a, a huge sort of graph of all the influences between papers. It's kind of fun that right now, if you look on um, op open uh, publication uh, repositories like Archive, there's about 100 new papers a day going in in, in AI. Uh, it's a bit alarming because, of course, they're not peer reviewed. Uh, so uh, this is kind of a whole area of interest. But when you look at the uh, major conferences like NeurIPS and so on, um, then uh, you can you can see the structure of uh, of what's happening. You can see where an organization sits in that in that structure and, and what its influence is. So that seems like an interesting thing to have as an ongoing exercise. We're just using very conventional off the shelf uh, NLP to do that work and a little bit of graph analytics. Nothing nothing really pushing the envelope there to, technically, but just to understand the uh, the landscape. Okay, so that's it from me. Um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, so I don't know if people want to ask questions. Um, I will turn my video back on so I can wave my hands. Um, Thanks, John. That's hand. great. Really fantastic overview. Um, so we do have a question about data study methods. Um, you hinted at possible challenges of operating data study methods with remote working. Um, as a sorry. As a collaboration across a number of member institutions, would colleagues have participated remotely or in a part-time capacity in these projects before the lockdown? And if so, how well do you think this has worked? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, yeah, so we didn't have uh, remote participants because the model that the Turing developed for the data studies was was physical. Having said that, the Turing helped with a data study hackathon that the Financial Conduct Authority ran last year, which was virtual, it involved 70 countries, seven zero countries, and it involved the financial regulators in those countries convening groups and then connecting them together. And that was incredibly successful. They had a whole bunch of, uh, of, of things they did in fraud detection, um, all kinds of mis-selling and analytics. That um, they published uh, the headline stories. Quite a lot of the results are somewhat confidential, but they were were able to publish things. And that was that was a fully virtual event. And and so I believe that running a virtual uh, hackathon or a virtual data study event is certainly feasible. I think the question is hinting at how you convene the group. Uh, when people don't know each other, and I think that is a, a, a big challenge. And I believe, in fact, that the biggest challenge for any event is how you bootstrap new projects, new research, uh, new institutes uh, without having physical meetings. So we've known this for 25 years. I've been working in video conferencing and the internet. And when we have first had European projects, we had a project called MICE, which was multimedia conferencing for Europe. And we were supposed to eat our own dog food. You know, we used multimedia conferencing to run the project, but we ended up realizing we had to have a plenary once a year where everyone went from all over Europe, all came to one partner to all chat and have a, a nice meal. Um, so we had all the meetings in France, obviously, and yeah, Italy, and my, not so often. My, my but yeah, so that, my, that's going to be tricky. 
my experience chimes with that. So, so Bristol hosted a Turing data study group a week last August. Um, and I think in some ways I'd underestimated the importance of the, the social side of it. Um, and my sense in the lockdown is that um, these remote platforms are great when uh, for, for maintaining established relationships, but developing new ones. Um, yeah, we're certainly at JGI racking our brains trying to think of ways of, of continuing to do that. Uh, there's another question. So, um, um, yeah, carry on. No, I was just going to say that in some conferences, we've started to build virtual reality environments where people can convene in virtual corridors. And so in the Eurosys conference, a system conference in Heraklion a couple of months back, we ran Discord, which is a gamer tool. And we had yeah. uh, well over a thousand people forming groups and having corridor discussions with mentors, which they did dynamically. And I think we need to try more of those things because that might help. Um, but yeah, and then virtual coffee events and so on. Yeah, with that, yeah. uh, because I think uh, we'll, yeah, three, yeah, next. Yeah, yeah. My, my, my 15 year old daughter was telling me we should be using Discord for these things, so you know, I should listen. <laughs> and we have another question. Um, somebody wondering whether you could tell us a bit more about how you think safe data havens are going to change the perspective in combining model predictions while preserving data privacy. In particular, do you think safe data heat havens could help in avoiding indirect data leakage embed train model parameters such as weights of an NM network? I was a deep dive technical question um, because the data safe haven doesn't leak the raw data, but the model can leak. Um, um, if you you know, for and there's there's some pretty good work. I mean, I'm not a, an expert. Emiliano de Cristofaro in UCL has done a bunch of things about uh, uh, ship identification and mitigating it. That's a sort of classic thing where you train data on a set of people. You don't reveal the data about the people, but you can accidentally reveal that they were in the data set. And then certainly in, in medical, that could be a problem. But there are ways to fix that. And that's just one example. Um, but I, I, uh, I think that's the gist of the question. And I think it requires further work because it's not about the data safe haven, it's about the modeling of the model and understanding what it might leak. Uh, and I, I, I think that is, uh, as I think the question has obviously thought about it and it needs more thought. It's a good, probably a great research topic. One more, I think. Um, somebody's saying they're doing a PhD that involves data science at a reasonably basic level. But thinking of going into data science more seriously after the PhD, would you recommend attending data study groups, hackathons as a learning experience, or are they more geared towards people at a higher level of understanding? I absolutely would recommend hackathons and data study. There, there really are uh, people in the middle of a PhD are typical attendees, and I think it's a, it's just a great experience. There's a mixed level of ability, a skill, uh, knowledge, uh, and that's actually. Uh, it's you know everyone's lifted by the event. Uh, I'm you know I'm I'm I've seen you know people don't get marginalised. They they get brought into it and it's you know it's this half of this goal is probably maybe even more than half the goal is to is to get people really immersed in understanding what's going on, not just coding, uh, but why are we using these tools? Seeing alternatives happen live, I think that's a really nice thing to see. So it's almost like, you know, some part of reproducible research is we try a, not just A, B, but C, D, and E. I mean, we literally try five different things and uh, on each problem. And so you, you get to see the rationale at the beginning of why those were five and not some other five, but then at the end, how did they play out and some have gains in some areas and others in other areas. So I, I think it's a really good way of, uh, of, of gaining experience. I, um, uh, it's, it's, it's hard work. Uh, I think that it's, it's not expected, but people seem to all stay up to about 11 or 12 every day. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's not exploitation. It's done completely voluntarily. Um, uh, so I, uh, I, I think it's just that just sort of an indication of the enthusiasm people get engaged. So I, yeah, I, uh, I used to do this in early internet stuff when I was involved. I was a PhD student. I wander into a standards group and people say, "Oh, we're just trying out this new version. Could you write one for that operating system?" You know, and I spend three days sweating, and at the end of it, you know, you just learn so much. It's amazing. 
Okay, one last short question in the interest of time, and then we're going to sign off. Um, are the data sources being used in DCOVID publicly available? If so, are these listed on the DCOVID website? Uh, I don't believe those data sources can be made publicly available for that project. Um, I, I would, I would be hard pushed to see. There might be a way. So, so the way forward with that, I suspect. Might be there's a group in the REG who do synthetic data, and they could use the real data to create synthetic data. I can't see that they had time to figure out how they would create anonymous anonymous data. Um, I'll take that offline, and if I find out more, uh, you know, I, 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 a better way forward might be to volunteer effort into the COVID projects and see if you get involved. But, uh, but I would be surprised if. If they can make that data available um, to other people, I think it would be my my you know my intuition is it's super super sensitive, uh, super private. Um, but uh, watch this space. I will, I will I will check on that. Great, thank you, John, and thank you to all our participants. Some great questions there, and a really interesting overview of your work at, at the Turing. Um, as Patty's just said in the chat. Uh, please uh, don't forget to share your experiences in Twitter or other forms of social media. Let people know that the, our week is happening. A very, very big thanks both to the speaker and to our helpers. The helpers today, Lily, Liz, Patty. Um, if those of you who, who have participated through Eventbrite, um, we will be sending an online feedback form at the end of the week. It would be really great if you could let us know what you thought about um, the offering over the week, um, the platforms that we've used, any kind of uh, any interaction challenges you've had. So it just remains for me to say thanks to everybody, and we hope to see you face to face soon. Stay well, um, and yeah, keep, keep well over the summer. Very thanks, John. Great. Bye for now. Bye.